Hello and welcome to the tutorial screencast. Uh, in this screencast, we will learn how to do modern application uh, web application development. I will not spend a whole lot of time talking about the theoretical aspects of things. There is a link associated with this video. So please look at the description of the video and you will find the link that contains all the documentation that you should read before uh, even watching this video. So at least you should read the introductory part of it. Anyway, so let's get started. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is fire up my browser and uh, in here's my browser and I go to mweb.spinspire.com and I am also going to start so here uh, if you read through this mweb.spinspire.com's uh, description, the page description, please do follow every step. Uh, you need NetBeans, you need Git Bash or some other means to be able to run SSH. And then you need a private public key pair. And uh, once you have that private public key pair, you need to uh, specify a unique username, something that does not exist. I will use username foo and then the public key now to get my public key, I start the shell and I copy my public key, which is oops, and uh, idrsa.pub. This is my public key. I copy the whole public key and I paste it into this form and I create the user. Yes, user created, you, are, you can visit the user's newly created site here. So I click on that and that is hello modern web development foo.mweb.spinspire.com. So that is my um, website address and this is my little web application. Obviously it's not much to look at. Let's start by SS, running SSH the user foo at mweb.spinspire.com spinspire.com and it says do you trust this I say yes and I'm in great so I'm able to log in if I look at my home directory there is mweb uh, that's the little if you see uh, in the foo at server 3 or um, or mweb this one mweb.spinspire.com if you look at the mweb directory let me cd to it and here there is index.html which contains the very same thing that is here okay so I can edit it all this but I'm not going to I'm actually going to use um, NetBeans to do that so let's fire up NetBeans I am about to show you how to configure your NetBeans so that you can edit this project let's get started first you hit new project in NetBeans. Remember you need the full version of NetBeans with PHP and everything present. I hit PHP and this PHP application is from a remote server. That's good. So let's next. The name of the project is mweb as in modern web. The source folder could be any place but I think it's okay to take the default. Just make sure you check this checkbox put NetBeans metadata into separate directory the benefit is that your project data project files will not clutter up your source code I think that's a good thing hit next now comes the important part you have to give the URL where your project is running and that is this URL so let's select this URL copy it and paste it here so it's basically HTTP colon foo or whatever your username you used dot mweb.spinspire.com now the remote connection you'll have to create your own remote connection click manage and add a new remote connection the connection name let's call it foo um, let's call it mweb because that's the server we are connecting to make sure the connection type is sftp click ok the host name will be mweb.spinspire.com username will be foo don't give a password because you are going to use your ID RSA key 
and then uh, you can use the same non host you can now when it comes to initial directory it will be make sure it is home slash foo or whatever the username that you're using let's test the connection and connection succeeded great click OK make sure you are using the mweb remote connection now the upload directory will be uh, slash mweb which basically means home, slash home slash foo slash mweb keep in mind that foo is my username you could use some other username click next it's fetching uh, the entire project click finish and with that you have a local copy of the project just make sure one thing go back into customize and then uh, upload files is on save which is fine you can uncheck this checkbox uh, upload files directly directly if you like to click OK now right now in my browser I can see hello modern web development I can just put and which is this string here I could just put a another heading three, two here and saying this is new so let's say heading two as soon as I save it watch what happens it's uploading the files that I'm saving here to up to the server so now when I refresh I see this is new this is great we are in business any changes that we make within NetBeans will be reflected on our website so but before we go very far let's uh, understand the logistics of what we are doing F make sure that you have you visit the mweb.spinspire.com website there are some instructions in there follow those uh, there are three things we will be following we'll be following this document it's a Google Doc and it describes what we are doing why we are doing it and how to do it so the current steps are there are many there are like 30 plus steps uh, we'll go get there and then also make sure uh, you open this git repository and in the git repository you can go to source or you can go to commits and these are the commits start from the very beginning the first commit which is the initial commit okay and then finally uh, there's a link to the video obviously I am recording that video right now so this link is not functional but by the time you watch this video uh, the video link will also be functional uh, like I did at the very beginning of the screencast you can create a new username user account and then make sure you post uh, you paste your uh, public key in here and then you will be able to log in as um, basically like SSH username which is foo in my case at mweb.spinspire.com so once you do that uh, so you'll be able to log in okay so then we went ahead and and uh, configured uh, NetBeans so that we have a local project that every time you modify and save it gets uploaded to the remote site which is this site username dot mweb dot spinspy dot com okay so I'm, I will go ahead and remove this h2 and then as soon as I save it and I refresh that addition is gone now let's l take a look at this uh, repository look at the initial commit uh, the link to the repository will be again in that document mweb uh, dot spinspy dot com but let's look at the commit the commit says this is all the commit has which is stuff that we have put in this index.html okay so if you want to see the structure of this um, the project you can see it in your netbeans project mweb directory it has nothing special it just has index.html and then this is the netbeans project file anyway so let's keep going next we this is this is nothing modern this is just an index.html file that gets served when you visit foo.mweb.spinspire.com step number two hit back 
and back again L let's take a look at this next commit this commit if I see side by side diff it will show me what I have done I'm basically adding a form okay so let's start adding the form um, right here form as you know HTML forms are the right way for you to interact and send information to the servers okay so right now it's locking up so in this form we will put a few uh, fields I guess and uh, Let's start with, let's say we are trying to write a ticket purchase form, okay? So we just put a label saying buyer name, close the label, put an input type text, and uh, we can say name of the field is buyer name and close the input let's save this and see how it looks all right so that's what it looks like i can type the whole thing or i am just going to copy paste this i have already typed it so why not all right so there it is so once i save this it let's go to the server I, I saved it so it gets uploaded to the server and now if I reload I see this so this is step number two where we turned a simple index.html file into a simple HTML form nothing special standard but in the next step we will let's see what we can do we can actually include bootstrap CSS framework so you will notice as soon as we include bootstrap the look of the form gets enhanced quite significantly so the way you include bootstrap is that you have to let me what is bootstrap first of all okay well first bootstrap if you go to the website get bootstrap.com it's a CSS framework and um, it has its origin in Twitter company but any case now it is an open source project and you can read all about it here on get bootstrap.com and you can download it just hit download i don't even bother to download i go straight to this link so just include this link from here to here copy and then back in here just paste that link and as soon as you do that, watch what happens. This um, not very good looking form becomes slightly better looking. Okay, so that's uh, that's decent. Next step is, but we are not taking full advantage of Bootstrap right now. To take full advantage, we have to add a few classes in our HTML, and that will enhance the look of our form quite significantly one thing we have to do is um, add some class equal to container to the at the body level and class form group and class form control for each uh, input uh, input so let's do that so I go back in here at body I say class container so I save it as soon as I save that and refresh as you see you can see that because I gave class container uh, the content is now centered and a little bit offset on the left so that's good then if I go to every div level and say class form group and at the input level I say class form control watch what happens save it and refresh see this is 
because I gave it a form control, it became a you know nice looking input box. Let's just do that very quickly at, at each level. I don't like to type, so I just copy and paste most of these things. Plus you watching the video don't want to just watch me do the boring stuff. Okay, so I basically put for class form group at, at, at each wrapper div and each input I'm putting class form control including select by the way and let's see if this works very nice that's good so look how each label is above the input and the input is fully wide and uh, finally I think adding these button classes also helps let's uh, do that so we say button class btn remember these classes come from bootstrap btn and btn primary and for reset we'll just put class btn mm, that's it save by the way i'm pressing control s that's why you see this going from dark gray to disabled and when i refresh look these buttons are also nice looking now so this is pretty pretty decent as you can see this is a ticket purchase form you give the buyer name you give buyer email you choose a seating section and the number of seats let's keep going so far uh, the aspect of modern web development that we have used is is html5 and css3 and the bootstrap css framework so next what we want to do is bootstrap comes with a powerful responsive grid so we want to uh, let's uh, do side by side diff and we will be able to see you see how you have class row and column sm6 small 6 so let me show you how that works so we will combine two of this uh, the buyer name and buyer email into a single div div from here up to here and then we give it a div class of row and then each of this form groups we give it an additional class of col as in column sm as in small 6 meaning bootstrap divides up the screen the, the page into 12 vertical columns okay 12 columns so now when we say col sm6 we are saying use six columns when the size of the window is small or larger than small which means anything greater than a mobile phone so let's uh, put the same class here on the second form group also save it and then refresh as I refresh you see because this entire grid is div divided in to 12 columns six columns on the left and six columns on the right divides them up evenly like divides up the horizontal space evenly between buyer name and buyer email the great thing about this is that if I resize this browser then until I reach the mobile size see as soon as I, I it, the browser got very narrow they turned into uh, full width but up to as long as some width is available they are 50-50 so Similarly, I can do the same thing for the other. So let me just reformat if I right click and say format, it formats it nicely. And now I can once again keep going and say div class row, which is the grouping, single row, and then close the so number of the seating section as well as the um, number of seats together and then I just say col sm6 six column for small and up 
and then uh, let's see save reload and now you have 50% for buyer name 50% for email 50% for seating section and 50% for number of seats the great thing is when the width gets smaller they basically expand to take full space this is the responsive grid uh, that bootstrap provides us all right now that we have uh, seen how the <clears throat> responsive grid from bootstrap helps let's uh, get back to html form processing again so what we will do now is we will start posting this form now in order to First, let's take a look at the form and see that it has um, various fields that have the name attribute, okay? It's very important, make sure that you have an, the name attribute in each of the input fields, because if you don't have a name attribute, then the form, when the form is submitted, these fields will never get submitted. They must have a name attribute in order to get submitted. All right, so next, <clears throat> Let's look at the next step that we are going to make which is Adding form submission and processing So what we will do is we will, in our form we will add an action attribute and of course we will also Add a form test dot php. So let's do that first in the form Let's add an action attribute action attribute is what basically tells the form when the form is submitted where to send the data so this is form test.php okay so this is our first brush with php i'm assuming that you have configured your web server to be able to execute php uh, but if you are using uh, mweb my mweb server then you don't have to worry about that it's already configured so what this says is that when the form is submitted let's submit the form right so let's just uh, put something in there and submit the form okay so that didn't submit any anywhere i have to re refresh so let's refresh the form and submit and then it says test for form test.php and then all the fields are there and it says file not found of course because the file doesn't exist let's create a php file called form test dot php extension is automatically added submit finish and when it gives you a an empty template like this just remove the boilerplate stuff and simply print underscore r which is a php function and then the item you want to print is dollar get so this dollar get underscore get in all caps is a super global and print underscore r simply prints every uh, it's a it's a function to print data structures and it prints the array or object or whatever complex uh, ob data structure that you give it okay so let's save this and go back and now hit submit again this time it does not say file not found it actually shows you every part of what you had submitted. Buyer name is test, buyer email is nothing, seating section is nothing, or oh, seating section is premium, sorry. And number of seats is nothing. Only problem is, this is not how I really wanted to see it. If I do view source, this is how I really wanted to see it. But it didn't show up like that. Why? Because when the PHP page returned the text the browser interpreted that text as HTML. And as you know, in HTML, new lines don't actually break the line. So to fix that problem, all we have to do is put header. So let the PHP tell the browser that the content type of the response is text slash plain and semicolon. So header is the PHP function that will generate an HTTP header. This is the name of the header content type. And this is the value of the header text plane. So once you save that and 
now when we submit the form there you go we received a response and the response had a content type of text play and that's why it shows up in a more legible legible manner and not uh, like a doesn't come, get interpreted as HTML and therefore new lines really mean new lines and line breaks. Okay. All right. Let's see what's the next step we want to take. So finally, we can, there are a few other PHP super globals. I showed you that you can print dollar get. There are a few other uh, super globals. Let's uh, try them out. So there is the get dollar get means the all the parts of the get request and then you can print dollar post which of course will be empty unless the request is a post request or print underscore r dollar request which is a combination of all get and posts parameters let's save the, this and now when we go back and let's say five seats and some email address hit submit and this is the dollar underscore server uh, the important things in the this are script name or rather a request uri look look at the request uri and then document root a lot of server related stuff as well as some of this comes from the request this is the dollar get with all the four parameters this is dollar post which contains nothing it's an empty array because we did not post we you have to understand that when a form has no request method specified then it defaults to method equal to get so that's why dollar post array is empty and this is the dollar request array which is like i said it's a combination of get and post parameters together the merge of the two so if we wanted to see the post parameters, post instead of a, a get, let's uh, go back here. Let's do inspect element. As you know, inspect element is um, one of the features of Chrome as well as Firefox. Nowadays, Internet Explorer also has it, but uh, I think uh, these other browsers are far ahead. So if I now hit submit, watch what happens. This is a get request, you see? The other thing that happens is all the parameters of the form, all the input parameters, they end up on the query string. That is the nature of get requests. The post requests, and which is exactly what we are going to try now, go to form and add a method attribute and give it a value of post. So if I save now, when I hit reverse, and then of course I have to refresh in order to make it a post. And if I, now at this point, let me clear this network tab. I wanna show you what happens when I hit submit. Okay, I hit submit, you see no, nothing on the query string. That's because the form request method is post, which means the request parameters go in the body of the of the request so if i show you right at the bottom do you see this this is the form data you can see it in source form and uh, it's probably very hard for you to see but let me oh, okay now hopefully you should be able to see this this is the form data as you can see there is an ampersand this looks just like your query string except that it's in the body of the request so it's not in the browser's address bar okay so that is your post request let's see what else uh, we can do with this so here in the next step, we basically convert it to method equal to post, which we already did. And then, <clears throat> so let's uh, uh, do a recap. We have a form, uh, HTML form, as you can see, 
with various name attributes on each of the input fields and the action is very important which uh, the action is form test.php method is post and form test.php do doesn't do whole lot just prints uh, a few super globals server get post and request all right so as we promised this is uh, about modern web application development so next we uh, take on another just like bootstrap another modern framework called angularjs let's go to angularjs.org and angularjs is a javascript framework that allows you to develop uh, web applications in a very advanced manner with a lot of interactive features so if you hit this is basically uh, what sort of like jquery but jquery has been around for at least 10 years now and um, AngularJS is the new kid on the block. It's not that new anymore. It also has been around for a few years. Uh, but it, it provides, it allows you to do MVC, like model view controller development in JavaScript. So let's go to angularjs.org, hit the download link. And don't actually download anything. You can just use AngularJS directly from their CDN link. So let's go to our HTML file and include in the header script src equals and then the paste the angularjs URL and close the script tag. That's it. That's, that includes angularjs. There's one more thing you need to do. An application is not an angularjs application until you put the ng app attribute in, in in any of the dom elements wherever you put ng app attribute everything below that becomes controlled by angular js so let's save that and now when we go to the web application refresh uh, nothing interesting happens really it's the same so in order to do something interesting what we have to do is we have to actually bind these input boxes to a model okay so now this is going to sound a bit strange but let's uh, but bear with me so you have input type text imagine that this is a purchase transaction of course it is they're trying to buy tickets so uh, the name of this input uh, field is buyer name let's bind it to uh, and for that you have the ng model and angular model and then you say purchase dot name I guess yeah buyer name so what we are doing is we are imagining that the current scope the ng app application scope or the controller scope has an object called purchase which of course we never created but let's imagine that there is one and then in that there is a field called name and what we are saying is that our this buyer name input box is bound to purchase.name similarly let's just copy this in and uh, paste it a few times so oops what did i do okay copy and uh, the buyer email is going to be purchase.email and then the seating section which is a select component is purchase dot seating underscore section and uh, number of seats which is another input box text box is purchase dot num underscore seats so now at this point we have bound multiple input fields with the model fields okay but in, in order to actually use the model, let's add a div. So here's a div outside of the form. And we say in this div, uh, you know, let's say summary h3 or whatever. What is it called? Let me see. Um, So yeah, we just say 
H2 purchase summary and uh, so H2 purchase summary okay heading to and then in there we say paragraph and we say you know so and so uh, number of seats in so and so section for this person at email so and so so we say purchase remember this double curly brace syntax is basically can you can reference angular expressions in double curly braces so double curly purchase dot num seats for uh, in purchase dot uh, seating section whatever this section for purchase dot uh, buyer name that is a name right um, at email and then purchase dot email okay let's see if this works so before I go very far you have to understand like once again you what we are doing is we are saying ng model and then some object dot na name some object dot email some object dot seating section each of these input fields are going to basically go, reference this object and its field and whatever you type into these uh, input fields they will modify the JavaScript object and then that JavaScript object is being rendered various fields of it are being re rendered here in this paragraph and it will update itself let's see how whether it works I go to this refresh and it says nothing in section for at email of course it's all mumbo jumbo uh, let's say buyer name is Jane Doe. So it says in section for Jane Doe at email, whatever. So if I say Jane at Doe.com, do you see as I'm typing, as I'm typing here, the model is getting updated and so is the view getting updated. So as I select a, diff a premium section, it says in premium section, if I select five seats, five seats in oh I forgot to say seats I can say that seats okay five seats in premium section for Jane Doe at email Jane at doe.com now as I am typing as I make changes they reflect in real time on your page that's pretty cool this is the power of angular JS and it is angular JS that is because we have an ng app you know bo at body level and everything under body is now controlled by angular which is included using the script tag and now uh, there is a model object called purchase and that has certain properties those properties are bound to the input fields and those properties are also displayed in this paragraph using double curly braces as the delimiter and now as you start typing you see real-time updates in the view the your typing is updating the model and the model is updating the view pretty cool all right now that we have this let's see what how can we create a modern web application using this okay so the problem is that um, as we were typing, um, you know, when, when we remove the name, it says nothing. <laughs> uh, and then it just skips those values. So if I wanted to put some defaults, how would you do that? So let me refresh this page. What we can do is we can basically give the pipe double pipes which is an or um, operator and then give a default value say zero seats for example in seating section you can say unknown seating section now the problem is you cannot just give bare words like this you have to quote them it's a string so you just put that string in single quotes 
so when seating section is not selected is null or blank it will fail over using this or operator Let's show this value instead the so same way um, you can say unknown buyer again single quoted string and then email uh, can be un at no <laughs> right so once you save this what you're doing is you're saying whenever this value is not available use this value when this is not available use this value and so on and so forth save this and let's refresh zero seats in unknown seating section for unknown buyer at email unknown pretty good as soon as we type the name of the buyer Jane and it says section unknown seating section for Jane uh, maybe it should be unknown seating section is already there so unknown seating section for let's say Jane and email address Jane at doe.com now you can see uh, as soon as we start providing a value it is no longer unknown or default or anything like that right so that's how we have fallback values next uh, it is typically we don't actually have ng app without a name so in this situation our angular app has no name that doesn't actually um, that's not a, a real usable solution so we will give a name to our app let's call it m web save it now if I refresh it will break my application let me uh, show you the inspect element view also while we are here now if I refresh you see you see there is an error this is an angular error if I click on it it says basically fail to instantiate module mweb so what happened is I named my ng app angular app mweb now angular is trying to look for a module named mweb so whatever your ng app name will be same there should be a module by that name so in order to provide that module we could just put a script uh, at the end of the body script and um, close the script and within this script what we have to do is create an angular module so a module no sorry angular dot module name of the module is mweb and then there is, you give uh, you end this javascript and then there is a second parameter the second parameter is the list of other modules that this module depends upon since uh, we are just starting out we don't depend on any other module and therefore what we are doing is asking angular to create you create me a module the name of the module is mweb and it has dependencies which is an empty list Let's save this and uh, refresh and the error goes away so yeah it's satisfied angular ng app which is equal to mweb it was able to create a module by that name it's all happy but in reality we, we don't want to put our um, angular module inside our HTML file let's uh, organize our code a little bit Let's create a new folder called JS as in JavaScript and within that let's create a new file JavaScript file called uh, app.js and let's remove all the boilerplate and whatever we were putting here in the script tag let's put that in app.js okay so that's our app.js it contains the same same code angular.module mweb 
and then let's remove the script tag well actually let's not remove it let so what we did was we took the inline javascript and put it off into a separate file and here we can say js app.js okay so with this if we refresh our page it still works of course nothing really works at this point but uh, there are no errors at least now what have we done so far we created a new module angular module okay whose uh, name is mweb it doesn't do much yet but it will all right so next step is to create remember if i if you remember i said angular is a mvc framework model view controller framework so let's create a controller what is the job of a controller it is to control uh, provide control to the application around the in this case the view uh, and the model so the controller binds the model and the view together it takes values from the view puts them in the model takes values from model puts them in the view and then does all the processing so let's uh, at the form level let's add an ng controller so that's your ng controller angular controller give it a, uh, some name purchase ctrl purchase controller and uh, let's save this and in app.js we have to create a controller if i now try to run the application as is it will complain that i it's complaining that it, there is no controller called purchase controller so i have to provide it how do i provide a controller you take the angular.module this is a highly chainable um, object so angular.module mweb is the mweb module on that you call this method using dot operator controller okay controller you give it a name purchase ctrl and then you give it a value and this is the second parameter of the controller method you go to the beginning let's uh, unindent this and say it's a function controllers are functions uh, so what you're providing is you're saying this is the module this function returned a module you call a method called controller on that module and you gave it two parameters first is the name of the controller second is the ja anonymous javascript function that makes up the controller okay let's l break the line and save and now when we refresh it it is happy there are no errors doesn't do a whole lot but just give me a second and it will start doing useful things okay so let's go to the next step so into that controller let us do something useful with the controller uh, the controller angular is a is an mvc framework but it uses dependency injection which means you can ask angular for certain dependencies to be injected into your controller so the dependency we are interested in is called dollar sign scope so what is dollar sign scope it's a base it's a holder for all scope variables including if you remember what scope scope variables we have been using we have been using this purchase object so we can now go to the code and say because angular has provided us with the scope we can now say dollar scope dot purchase and uh, in there we can say the number of seats in this purchase object so purchase this is an empty object but in there we say num underscore seats zero so keep in mind that when we come here first num number of seats is, is blank not even a zero but a blank so now as soon as i save this what is going to happen is the form binds itself to the ng controller purchase ctrl which will get instantiated angular will instantiate this function with a dollar scope variable 
injected into it and we this function will inject a scope variable called purchase with a property called num seats whose value is zero watch what happens when i re refresh L pay attention to this number of seats field i refresh and number of seats seats gets initialized with zero if i wanted to um, do other things like I could even say buyer name. So I could say um, the name of the buyer is Jane Doe. Save and then I could save it. So now when I refresh the starting value of the buyer name is Jane Doe. I don't think that makes sense so I'm going to delete it but I just wanted to show you that you could do that. Okay. And from this point onward, whatever changes you're making uh, in the fields, they are, since it is bound in, to ng model scope.purchase, if all of the, your changes are happening to these values. There's a pretty good um, trick there. Let me show you. You could f inspect element and get to the form level, which is, so get to the point where the ng controller is bound. Now, I don't know if you know this, but in in um, Firefox developer tools and Chrome developer tools, dollar sign zero is a variable that indicates that is bound to the target of your inspect element. So if you are on form element in inspect element window, then dollar sign zero points to that DOM uh, the dollar the form DOM element. So, you can now wrap this $0 into angular.element and give it $0 and you can now extract the scope out of, out of there. Once you do that, look what ha happens. This is the scope object on this form. It has a purchase object, you see, which has other things. But now let me type something in here. If I say Jane Doe, buyer email, whatever, some email and if I say premium section and five seats now watch what happens angular dot element dollar zero is still pointing to the form and if you try to extract the scope from it and from that scope try to extract purchase object there's your purchase object do you see what what the purchase object the state is num seats is five name is Jane Doe if I change from Jane Doe to John Doe, just say John. As soon as I do that, and now if I print the same information, this time the name is John. So this is this object is getting updated in real time. And that's the power of the MVC framework that is Angular JS. So and that's of course the, um, the value of binding, power of binding. Okay, so let's uh, keep going. We injected scope. Let's uh, add some. Okay, so now to make this form a little more user friendly, what we could do is when you delete these things and when these things are not apps, not present, uh, there may be the, it's a good idea to have some kind of a hint for the user. So all we have to do is go to index.html and then in the input boxes, we can add some placeholders. So we can say placeholder, and then whatever you want to say um, in terms of um, hints for the user. So in our case, you uh, can just say placeholder your name, and yeah, must match the ID. <laughs> so because they are buying tickets, I guess it makes sense for them to bring their ID and this is the the buyer's name and uh, you know you could say placeholder your email and then some kind of a hint about the email instructions basically and the number of seats so let's see we go to num seats and here's placeholder enter the name number of seats number only if i save this and once we go to the page and refresh it now do you see that 
hint in each of these fields so when you delete this it says enter number of seats number only so whenever this field is empty you will see the hint but as soon as you fill that field the hint goes away so that's the job of placeholder again this is a an HTML5 attribute it's a pretty nice feature of modern web applications okay so now what we will do is we, currently our form index.html when we submit the form let's submit the form and see what happens so if I put some information in here and uh, okay so let's see what happens I hit submit let's stay on the network tab clear this hit submit and it actually submits just like it would any other form nothing special um, because it, it is not an Ajax form submission this is a full form submission and when we submit it submits to the to form on dash test dot PHP and it is a post all this is specified right here as you can see right here so that's nothing new but you know what let's delete the action as well as the method attributes once you delete that and replace it with ng submit now that's your opportunity to convert this from a regular form submission get or post to Ajax request or more precisely any kind of JavaScript processing so let's uh, create a, let's say ng submit and then the parentheses so keep in mind that any uh, whether it is a ng model um, variable reference or a function call all of these are simply methods and fields and properties of the scope object which means in order to run it let's go ahead and try to see what happens uh, refresh I clear this hit submit and I should probably have well nothing happened nothing happened because there is no submit method let's create the submit method go to app.js remember all these things are properties of scope so just say scope.submit and give it a, an anonymous function and that's the body of the submit function for now let's just say console.log um, let's say purchase is the purchase object now of course we are not passing the purchase object let's say somebody is passing us the purchase object so we save this and back in here instead of just submit we say submit purchase so what you have to understand is it takes this purchase object and passes it into scope dot submit method call with the purchase object as a parameter which ends up here and then you can console log it let's put give it a semicolon here save it let's see what happens refresh fire name test email address t at y um, standard section five seats hit submit and look what happened this is the submit function executing with purchase object and simply printing the purchase object well this is not exactly an Ajax request but this is pretty good pretty useful because JavaScript captured the form submission it didn't actually even do the form submission it simply uh, intercepted the form submission so at this point we are ready to start making some Ajax request all right so in order to make the Ajax request we need a um, a new dependency called dollar HTTP so in here just like we asked angular to provide us dollar scope we can ask angular to provide dollar HTTP so what is dollar HTTP it is angular service that makes it possible to make Ajax calls so 
let's say purchases we, we log this but then now remember we are inside purchase controller which is a function from here to here but then we are within that in a in an inner function okay which is a submit function we can say dollar inside that we can use this injected service dollar http and then dot post we can post to and post to what well let's post to test sorry form test form test dot php and the object that we are going to post to it is the second parameter and that will be the purchase object okay and uh, that should be it let's see what happens um, let's see so oh one more thing we are not only just posting so this dollar HTTP is the service that will make an Ajax call it will post to this URL and it will post this object remember it posts it as JSON we'll find out very soon but then when it finishes asynchronously after the request has finished successfully we want to do something and that something is uh, run this callback and that's this callback this is an anonymous, anonymous function it takes one parameter which is the response object uh, not response object but the response body and we will simply print console.log with the data label print the data object Let's see how this works. Well, take a look at it again. From the ng submit of attribute of the form, we are calling submit with the purchase object. And that submit is this scope.submit takes the purchase object, logs the purchase object, invokes $http.post and um, posts it to this URL. Here's the object. And only when it succeeds, which will happen asynchronously, remember this is Ajax, um, then when it successfully comes back, takes the data object, which is the body of the response, and logs it. Let's see. Refresh. Test. THY. Plus. Five. Ah, look at that. It is logging the response. This is the response it received. Of course, the response is that plain text response that we had received. Uh, and as you can see, get, post, and request, everything is all blank. So what really happened? How come it didn't actually receive any of these num seeds and blah, blah, blah? Well, it, it did receive it, just not in the form that it expected. One thing that you must notice is the content type that we posted to it is not a form post it is application json and that's the key information about dollar http by default dollar http dot post is going to post data as json and that's the key piece of information actually it's pretty useful thing now what we can do is we can modify our test form so that it can consume JSON. So how can it consume JSON? Well, we simply check the, the content type. So let's do that. In the form test.json, .php, I'm sorry, which say if preg match and the first is the pattern basically if you delimited the, the pattern with the slashes and you say in the very beginning you have application uh, wait what is it this x www form url encoded so application slash but since this is a literal slash we have to escape it escape application x www form url encoded let me make sure i spell it right yeah it is that so 
this is the pattern and the subject is string is server HTTP content type so what we are doing here is if the HTTP content type key value within dollar server which means this header called content type matches application slash x dub 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 form URL encoded then do what you have been doing which is this so this will still work for regular form posts okay and then let's duplicate this sorry on the other hand if it is application JSON that you posted right then my response will also be application JSON and what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically read the incoming data so to read the incoming data I have to say in PHP to read the body of the request you say file get contents and then the file that you are trying to read is called PHP colon slash slash input it's kind of it's kind of strange the way PHP does it but this is called a stream wrapper in PHP so in any case uh, this will give you the body of the incoming request and let's JSON decode it basically uh, decode it as if this was a JSON string which it is by the way and that's your incoming data object that's the object that the requester sent to you this will be the purchase object in our case and then what we do we simply JSON encode it back okay but if all we did was that the response won't reach the client so we have to actually print it so we JSON encode it and print it and that will send the response back to the requester save this and let's give it another try submit there's the response let me try show it to you again let me just refresh the page now hit submit that's the request object going out and this is the response object coming in they are obviously same they are identical because the form test.php is doing nothing but just decoding the json object on its own end and then encoding it back to the requester all right so this is this is very interesting we are already making ajax requests and getting back ajax response and we are doing it in json so uh, the outgoing data format is json sorry right there and then incoming data format is also json and we are doing all that over ajax using this dollar HTTP service that's that's very cool this is what we mean when we say modern web application development using JavaScript Ajax and JSON okay at this point we are ready to start doing some uh, real programming on the server side by actually uh, persisting this data that we are submitting to, to the server but in order to persist data we need a database a relational database in our case we are lucky to have um, mysql on the server so let's go to the server ssh foo at mweb.spinspire.com and uh, we are connecting to it okay so that's good we are connected and um, on the server we can simply run mysql that's it and when we run mysql we get logged in and we say show databases and that will show us this database called dev underscore foo underscore mweb basically dev underscore whatever the name of the user that i created remember i created my user here on mweb.spinspire.com as foo and then the name of the application is mweb okay so this is my database 
and I am going to connect to it. But how did it connect to it with the database? Is there no password? Well, there is a password, and it is in my dot in my home directory tilde slash dot my dot cnf, and that's my password. It's kind of long and complicated. But that's because it's a randomly generated hex string. Okay, so let's uh, run my SQL and connect ourselves to dev underscore username underscore mweb. So now we are connected and let's create a table. So here is my table. I have a, again, you have access to this uh, same Bitbucket repository and in you can see a link to it in the document that is linked from the video. So let's select this. Uh, it basically says create a table uh, which is called mweb purchase. It has a an ID, um, basically a primary key. It is auto increment, um, not null. It has a field called buyer name, varchar 100. It is also not null, buyer email, and so on and so forth. You can you can see everything that is there. Okay, so. Let us copy this from here up to here and simply run it. And that creates the table. Let's see, describe M web purchase. So that's your table. Okay, now that we have a table, uh, if I do select star from mweb purchase, uh, it's an empty, empty set. That's good. So now let's uh, start actually sending data. Uh, we will create a new file called purchase.php. Okay, let's call it purchase.php and in here we will actually connect to the database. Now when we connect to the database you will need to provide a username password and all that. It is not a good idea to store your username and password and the database name. All these things should be external to the application. They should not be part of the source code of the application. So that's why in PHP, we say we will do include ones of config.php. That's the configuration of the application. And now we open, create a new file called config.php in which we can keep a variable called database. And that is an array. And in the array, we can put uh, the database name, the URL, and so on and so forth. All that information is present in this uh, file, so we'll just copy that. So that's your database array. It has a URL, and the URL in case of PHP's MySQL driver, you say ph in the MySQL colon host equal to the host name, which is localhost. And database name equals your database name and you give provide a separately username and password so let's just copy this and I paste that right here and of course my database name is dev underscore foo underscore m web my username is foo my password is well it's actually present in my server I can just cat my dot cnf which I it's a password that I can never remember which is fine and I paste that password here it's okay if you can see my password I'm going to change it by the time you see this okay so that's your my config.php which I have included from my purchase.php. This point, I can say global dollar database. 
remember database is in another file so we we have to reference it using global prefix so which makes it available to us in this file and then i say new p d o and then name of the data the url so database url and then the dollar database username is the second parameter then dollar database password is the third parameter these three things together make up a database handle so a new pdo basically creates a database handle based on the U database url username and password so that should connect us to the database and then once we are connected to the database we will not do anything fancy we will do the same thing we were doing in form test which is simply this part copy this uh, where we produce application json response and we consume json response so let's just so and now i can reformat this so what i'm doing is i'm just connecting to the database and going about my business as if nothing else has happened uh, so i'm not actually using that database i will make use of it very soon so let's see what happens refresh inspect element just to see what happens on the console okay uh, let's give some values submit and i actually got a response back now hold on i might be making so okay i think i made a mistake i have not i am not submitting to form uh, to purchase.php i'm submitting to form test.php so let's fix that this will now uh, submit to purchase.php refresh go make the submission again submit it still seems to work but is it really working to mess up and cause an error i am going to change the username to foo underscore x and that will prevent the database connection from getting created successfully so purchase.php will not be able to create a database handle and hopefully that will cause some kind of an error let's do it again submit and there you go i got a 500 error i know for sure that means i was not able to connect i undo my mistake in config.php and just hit submit one more time uh, let me clear this first yeah hit submit one. and now it works so now i know for sure that purchase.php is connecting to the database all right so the next step will be to start actually inserting into the database. Let's do that. So before we go very far, I just wanted to let you know that I am, conf uh, I am, um, I am running this project with uh, Git. So what I did was I made sure that config.php is included in dot git ignore file so that it doesn't get committed to git repository by mistake that's something worth noting any case let's keep going let's insert so to insert what we have to do is we have to we once once we have the database handle we can write an sql statement that SQL statement can have bind variables. I will show you in a second. And then you prepare that SQL statement, dbh arrow prepare, and then provide it with some parameters. And then those parameters, uh, you finally execute the statement, which will insert, and then you, you can, and that, that should create a new row. Let's find out if this all of this works. First, let's write the SQL statement. Let me just copy all of this code. So back in here, 
in purchase.php that's my code first I create SQL statement which is just a string insert into mweb purchase then these are the columns that I'm going to insert these are the values that I'm going to insert in those columns so as you might notice that co values are now prefixed with colon these are bind variables and uh, so there is buyer name buyer email seating section and num seats right so now let's pay attention to what is the object the structure of the object is num seats name email and seating section okay keep that in mind so name this is the data incoming oh by the way we, we have to create a statement handle by calling prepare on this SQL then we create an array of parameters left hand side is always the bind variable name right hand side is the value name then email section ours is called seating underscore section and um, then number of seats and then finally we take the statement handle execute it and that should hopefully insert let's find out if it works so before we start let's make sure that you see there are no rows so now if I hit submit hmm, might have worked might not have I don't know let's find out so let's start from mweb purchase hmm, didn't actually work did not actually submit did it apparently it did not so we wouldn't even know if it let's make sure that these uh, buyer name buyer email seating section and num seats these are the um, buyer name buyer email seating section and num seats yeah they're all good and on the server hopefully app.js is sending to purchase.php and purchase.php has all this stuff it should kind of work let me make sure I did not make any mistake okay I discovered my error what I had done completely wrong was uh, the dollar data object doesn't even exist so all this that I'm doing has to ha actually happen after I have JSON decoded so this is the right place to do it before that dollar data obviously does not even exist so let's save this so keep in mind first you JSON decode your in input then you do all the SQL stuff and uh, now you go back um, let me connect to my SQL again and select star from mweb purchase nothing submit and now select star from mweb purchase look at that we have our first row if I change this name to Jane Doe and Jane at Doe.com and I go to premium section and buy two tickets for Jane submit and again select start from MWeb purchase there it is Jane Doe and Jane at Doe.com premium two tickets it's very good okay so with this we are actually able to insert into our table using Ajax using AngularJS and a JSON based uh, RESTful service so if you look at this application and if I remove the name and I remove the email address and I remove the number of seats and all that if I hit submit it still seems to work but of course it doesn't actually work uh, it doesn't it actually oh boy it injected blanks so what if it okay that's interesting but the thing is if it failed to insert would it still work so we need to first start checking some errors uh, execute method returns true or false if it succeeds it returns true so if execute that's the success case 
and then else is the failure case. So what we should do is we should cause some kind of an error and see if this works. So to indicate an error, we have to say HTTP response code of um, various failure codes exist. We will use 400, which means a bad request. And then we will, um, let me see, describe mweb purchase and uh, cannot be null any of those, but they still have, okay. In any case, uh, let's, um, yeah, so let's uh, see if anything would cause some kind of an error. Uh, we could, just to cause an error, we could change, remove this number of seats default of zero. Let's hope that causes an error. We just want to cause some error. So in order to detect an error, what we have to do is we have to check the return code of execute. It should be false. And then uh, the error info is dbh dot error info. So we could just print that. So we take take db dollar sign dbh error info right and JSON encode it right and then print it so that should and then of course we do have exit if we don't exit then uh, it will go on to the to this next line which probably is not a good thing so save it and I am just trying to create an error let's see if this creates an error we do everything blank oh 404 that's fine submit and there you go I got a bad request response excellent so this is the this is okay well, let me go back to console again so this is the 400 bad, bad request and uh, if you look at the network and let me submit again. That's the. I am not able to see the response. So somewhere in the network log, I should be able to see. Oh, there it is. So in. If I go to app.js, go to XHR request, I am not able to see those XHR requests. Anyway, so, but you get the point where the HTTP response code 400 is generated because the insertion failed. If you look at this, no new insertions, oops, sorry. Yeah, since then, uh, unless I actually give a Z number here, it won't work. And did that cause a 400 error? I don't know. Yeah, I think it did. Still no new insertions. If I put some value in here, premium, then I think it will, oh, still a problem, good. And if I give some value here, then no problem. That succeeded. Cool. So now we have a little bit of error handling. Let's keep going and uh, so if we wanted to know the ID that was in injected, all we have to do is assign the ID and determine it using last inserted ID. So when we succeed, we say dollar sign dbh last inserted ID, and we'll just assign it to data ID. So this way, when we insert back here, uh, let me clear this. So when we insert, when we make the request, it's num seats and all these values are there, but there's no ID. But then when we successfully insert, it returns back the ID of the object that it inserted. That's cool. 
again the function to use is last insert id um, so i think this is a good point to stop we will do the rest uh, in the next next video so at this point i think we have achieved quite a bit we are able to inject make ajax calls uh, use angular js for uh, real time updates um, mvc update and make ajax uh, calls json calls um, exchange data using json and all this we are able to even insert into MySQL database using PHP's PDO library. Let's continue in the next video. So please do um, exercise, uh, like um, practice all this. You can go to my um, Bitbucket repository. It's uh, bitbucket.org slash jitesh underscore doshi slash mweb. And you can see every commit all the source code. Also, this video has a has some description on the links, which will show you how to get all the resources and practice all this on your own. Until next time.